live fast, die young, and leave a good-looking corpse. It's a famous phrase, but one that's often misattributed to a certain cult icon. Even if you've never seen any of his films, there's a good chance you'd recognize his face. Most people can put a name to that face, too, and if you can, there's also a fairly good chance that you know how the man behind that face died. After all, it isn't every day that one of Hollywood's brightest stars dies in a high-speed collision at the age of 25. On September 30th, 1955, James Dean died, leaving behind a not-so-great-looking corpse and the even worse-looking wreck of a Porsche known as Little Bastard. While news of the promising young actor's demise broke hearts, Little Bastard was used for parts, and wherever those parts went, tragedy followed. Freak accidents, brake failures, burst tires, mysterious fires. People tried to warn James Dean that there was something sinister about his beloved new car, but he didn't listen. So I won't bother warning you, either. Instead, I invite you to get in the passenger seat for a wild ride through one of the more modern chapters of the Datacombs in this installment of Cursed, Little Bastard. James Byron Dean was born on the 8th of February, 1931, in the small town of Marion, Indiana. The Dean family was one of humble origins. His father, Winton, was a farmer when he married Mildred Marie Wilson in 1929. Hoping to better the family's circumstances, he began work as a dentist, and two years after their marriage, the couple welcomed their first and only child. When little James was six years old, the family moved to the vastly different city of Santa Monica, California but he wouldn't enjoy those sunny skies for long. Mildred Dean died of cancer on July 14, 1940, and the nine-year-old James was promptly set off to live with his uncle Marcus and Aunt Hortense on the devoutly Quaker couple's farm back in Indiana. Marcus was a keen sportsman who encouraged his nephew's naturally competitive spirit. By the time James started high school, the teenager excelled at baseball, basketball, track and field, drama, and public speaking. On his 16th birthday, Uncle Marcus surprised Dean with a gift he wouldn't expect to receive from a Midwestern Quaker farmer, a Czechoslovakian motorcycle. James Dean loved it. He painted the bike in his school's colors and started hanging out at the local motorcycle shop. He was soon seen speeding around town, performing tricks and racing friends. Unsurprisingly, James became even more popular at school. Unfortunately, the gift also ignited a passion that would seal Dean's fate. For it wasn't long until his newly found need for speed led to an enthusiastic interest in sports car racing. Following his graduation from Fairmount High School, James Dean returned to California, where he briefly studied law before transferring to UCLA to study theater. His early acting career was a far cry from the fame he would later achieve. Dean played uncredited bit parts in films and acted in commercials, including his first televised appearance in a Pepsi ad, before moving once again this time to New York City, where he began playing more substantial roles in television and on Broadway. Soon, the handsome young actor's talents would get him noticed, setting him off on the road to stardom and on a collision course towards a curse. In 1954, Dean finally caught his big break when he was cast as the lead in an adaptation of John Steinbeck's novel, East of Eden. The film was a tremendous success, and the actor's brooding performance skyrocketed him to fame almost overnight. No one knew it would be the only one of James Dean's films to be released while he was alive. Fame and fortune wasn't on his mind, however, because after cashing his first big Hollywood paycheck, Dean was finally able to afford his first sports car, a 357 Porsche Super Speedster. Despite warnings from friends, family, and concerned film executives, the burgeoning star began to enter in amateur races across California, and perhaps with cause, because he was pretty damn good. Dean finished in second place at the 1955 Palm Springs Road Race, 
and was first in his class at a Bakersfield race later that year, coming in third overall. East of Eden was soon followed up by Rebel Without a Cause, an even more iconic performance which cemented Dean's reputation as an angst-ridden, cigarette-smoking, car-racing bad boy. By now, the 24-year-old was idolized by men and lusted after by women, an internationally famous symbol of youthful post-war rebellion. Fame and fortune wasn't on Dean's mind, however. That was preoccupied with his search for his next big thrill. In the actor's own words, racing was the only time I felt whole. Not everyone in Hollywood shared that sentiment. Before Dean was cast in his next and final film, Giant, director George Stevens insisted that his contract with Warner Brothers include a clause barring the actor from racing during production. Dean reluctantly agreed, but as soon as filming had wrapped up in Texas, he sped back to Los Angeles and began to prepare for another race. Once again, Dean would cash in his paycheck for a new set of wheels. Only this time, those wheels would become cursed. Literally. On September 21st, 1955, James Dean purchased a car from expert German mechanic and former Luftwaffe pilot, Rolf Wuthreich. Dean handed over the keys to his speedster and $6,900 in exchange for a Porsche 550 Spyder. The state-of-the-art convertible sports car was perfect for the actor's racing ambitions, complete with a hand-built, air-cooled 547 engine. It was the most expensive thing Dean had ever bought, but he wouldn't live to enjoy it for long. Before the car was ready for the track, however, it needed a racing stripe. Dean brought his new ride to famed Hollywood car customizer George Barris, designer of the Munster coach and builder of the original Batmobile. According to Dean's specifications, the car would be reupholstered with tartan seats, the number 130 painted on the hood and the driver's side door, and as a final touch, the name Little Bastard was carefully stenciled just under the Porsche emblem on the chassis caboose. You might be wondering, why that name? According to Warren Newton Beef, author of The Death of James Dean, it was an inside joke. Little Bastard was the playful nickname given to Dean by the actor's stuntman and language coach, Bill Hickman. The much more vertically gifted Hickman, who stood almost two heads taller than Dean, was affectionately called Big Bastard in return. James Dean was incredibly proud of his newly customized piece of highly powered German engineering. But from the start, many people around him sensed that something wasn't quite right with the little bastard. The actor's girlfriend, Ursula Andres, felt it had an evil presence and refused to get in the car. Another actress by the name of Eartha Kitt felt a similarly malign presence while on a drive in the passenger seat. Supposedly, she remarked, James, I don't like this car. It's going to kill you. Two days later, on September 23rd, Dean was driving the little bastard on the Warner Brothers studio lot when the actor received a stern warning from director George Stevens. You can never drive this car on the lot again. You're gonna kill a carpenter or an actor or somebody. Little did Stevens know, it wasn't just the last time he'd see that Porsche in the studio lot. It was also the last time he would ever see its driver. The final warning came later that night. Dean had spent the evening driving around the city, showing off his new toy before making a pit stop for dinner in Hollywood. As fate would have it, Alec Guinness had the same idea. The two actors had a chance encounter outside of a restaurant and struck up a conversation. Dean was keen to show off his little bastard, and Guinness obliged. As he asked how fast the car could go, Dean cheerily replied 150 miles an hour. A sense of unease began to overwhelm the superstitious Brit. According to his memoirs, Guinness felt that the sports car looked sinister and pleaded with the young actor, please do not get into that car, because if you do, if you get in that car, you'll be found dead in it by this time next week. It was a premonition that would come to pass, haunting Guinness for the rest of his life, but the blissfully unaware Dean just laughed. Exactly one week later, Dean donned his favorite jacket, the iconic red bomber worn in Rebel Without a Cause, and headed to Competition Motors in Hollywood. The actor had plans to compete in a race that weekend, so he did what any responsible driver would do and took his car in for a thorough inspection. Rolf Woodreich, the expert German mechanic who had sold Dean the Porsche, gave Little Bastard a clean bill of health. Big Bastard, aka stuntman Bill Hickman, was there too, along with photographer Sandy Roth. Originally, their plan was to drive up to Salinas in Dean's 1955 Ford Country station wagon, towing the Porsche behind them, but Woodreich suggested that Little Bastard might perform better in an upcoming race if Dean put a few miles on the car first. The actor agreed and set off for Salinas, Northern California with his mechanic in the passenger seat. 
Hickman and Roth would take the station wagon and attempt to take photographs of Dean's most prized possession along the way. It turned out to be pretty hard to get a good shot, though. The station wagon struggled to keep up as Dean sped down what was then Highway 99, now called the Five. When the group stopped to enjoy cold drinks at a roadside diner, Dean's beverage of choice that day was milk, Hickman warned Dean that he was driving too fast and should slow down. After all, didn't the famously vain actor want any good shots of him behind the wheel of the little bastard? Apparently not. As they turned back onto the highway, Dean sped up to 68 miles per hour, breaking the speed limit. Hickman did his best to keep up. At around 3.30, they were pulled over near Bakersfield. Both Dean and Hickman were given speeding tickets and a stern but fatefully ineffective warning. Not long after the run-in with the law, the group made another stop for refreshments. As luck would have it, two of Dean's friends and fellow racing enthusiasts had the same idea. Lance Revendlow and Bruce Kessler were on their way to Salinas as well, and the pair warned Dean that he might want to slow down for the last stretch of the drive, as they'd also received speeding tickets that afternoon. Once again, Dean shrugged it off and proceeded to race down the road towards his date with destiny. The group headed west on Highway 446, now State Route 46, towards Paso Robles. Sources disagree as to how fast Dean was driving. Most say he was flying by at 85 or 90 miles an hour, while others argue he was barely pushing 60. But all agree on the following fact. By 5 o'clock that evening, Dean's group was approaching the small community of Cholane, just as a college student named Donald Turnipseed was traveling east on the same stretch of road. Unfortunately, he couldn't see the low-profile Porsche barreling towards him as he prepared to turn left onto Highway 41. By the time Dean saw the 1950 Ford Tudor turning across his path, it was too late for him to stop. He attempted to swerve out of the way and avoid crashing, but it was no use. He'd been driving too fast. At approximately 5.15 p.m., Little Bastard hit the front passenger side of Turnip Seed's car. The sheer force of the collision launched the Porsche nearly 55 feet into the air, ejecting the seatbeltless Wuthreich in the process. There were several witnesses of the crash, including John Robert White, who recalled seeing the car do two or three cartwheels while smashing into the ground several times, before finally coming to a stop. The Ford Tudor was thrown 39 feet down the westbound lane of Route 466, but miraculously, Turnipseed walked away from the accident relatively unscathed, aside from some nasty bruises and a bloodied nose. The little bastard's passengers weren't so lucky. Wuthreich sustained multiple serious injuries, including a broken jaw, fractured pelvis, and shattered left thigh bone. The unconscious but still living mechanic was sprawled out on the highway's shoulder next to a horribly mangled mass of twisted, crumpled metal. It was the unrecognizable wreckage of Little Bastard, and its driver was still trapped inside. The impact had caused severe internal and external injuries. In addition to suffering from two broken arms, a fractured jaw, and a snapped neck, Dean's left foot was crushed between the clutch and brake pedal. Although a passerby who also happened to have some training as a nurse detected a faint pulse, she didn't have much hope in the Hollywood star's survival. Hinkman and Roth had been quite far behind the speeding Dean, and about 10 minutes after the collision, they arrived on the scene. Hinkman was able to free his friend from the twisted pile of steel and aluminum, but nothing more could be done. When the ambulance finally arrived, both of Little Bastard's unlucky passengers were taken to Paso Robles War Memorial Hospital, about 30 minutes away from the crash site. Wuthreich was still alive and immediately sent to undergo emergency surgery, but Dean wouldn't survive his final ride. At 6.20 p.m., the 25-year-old actor was pronounced dead on arrival. James Dean was buried in his hometown of Fairmont, Indiana on October 8, 1955. His sudden death at the age of 25 caused the actor's popularity to skyrocket. Over 600 people attended his funeral, a closed casket affair concealing his horrendous injuries from the eyes of mourning loved ones, while an estimated 2,400 fans participated in the funeral procession. One month after the crash, Rebel Without a Cause premiered, and theaters across the nation were filled with the tear-stained faces of love-struck teenagers. Dean would become the only actor to ever be nominated for an Academy Award posthumously in both 1956 and 1957 for East of Eden and Giant, respectively. In most cases, this tragic story would have ended there, largely forgotten after a few speeches at a Hollywood awards ceremony. Dean's body may have been resting peacefully beneath a pink granite headstone back in Indiana, but there was one more matter to attend to. What would happen to his beloved little bastard? At the time, the answer must have seemed pretty straightforward. The car was declared a total loss. 
though describing the mangled shell of a Porsche as totaled is more than an understatement, and returned to Dean's father along with compensation from the insurance company. Unsurprisingly, Winton Dean wanted nothing to do with the unrecognizable hunk of metal his son had just died in, and disposed of the wreckage as quickly as he could. What exactly happened to Little Bastard at this point is up for debate. George Barris, the aforementioned Hollywood car customizer, claims to have purchased the Porsche's remains from Winton Dean for $2,500. If this is the case, his motivations for the purchase aren't entirely clear. It has been suggested that they weren't entirely honorable, and perhaps that played a factor in events to come. Other sources state that the wreck ended up in a salvage yard in Burbank, California, where it was purchased by Dr. William F. Eisrich. In addition to being a successful dentist, Eisrich was a keen racing enthusiast who had competed against Dean several times in 1955. He removed some of the parts from his recently deceased opponent's car before selling off the frame to Barris for $1,000. While I was unable to verify which of these versions is more accurate, all that really matters is that both men ended up with parts of Little Bastard, and both would soon regret it. While the car was being towed in a Barris' workshop, it slipped off the trailer and broke a teenage mechanic's leg. The curse of Little Bastard had begun. Dr. Esrich was unaware of this fact before having the Porsche's drivetrain and suspension put into his own Lotus 9 sports car. If he had known, the Burbank dentist probably wouldn't have let any of the cursed components near his beloved racing vehicle, nor that of his good friend, Troy McHenry, either. Alas, they were unaware of the danger, and Little Bastard's 547 engine was sued inside McHenry's own Porsche a 550 Spider nearly identical to Dean's. In 1956, the pair of friends entered their newly improved sports cars in the Pomona Road Race. Shortly after the race began, Troy McHenry lost control of his vehicle, which careened headfirst into a tree. He died instantly. S. Rich hadn't noticed the crash and continued driving when out of nowhere, the wheels locked up just as he entered a turn, flipping the car over and sending it tumbling across the track. S. Rich survived to learn that his friend had died, but was left with massive injuries. Meanwhile, the majority of Little Bastard remained in the possession of George Barris. After selling two of its tires to an anonymous man, only to hear that the buyer had died in a car accident when both tires simultaneously burst with explosive force, sending the car off the road and into an unnamed obstacle, the driver did not survive. Little Bastard's curse had claimed victim number two. Barris decided he'd be better off keeping any and all parts of Little Bastard off the road opting instead to put the wreck into storage. One might assume the curse would be effectively ineffective under these circumstances, but once again, the prospect of obtaining memento of Dean's death would spur the curse on. In late 1956, a pair of would-be cursed carjackers attempted to get their hands on a piece of the action. As one attempted to pry off the steering wheel, his arm was sliced open by the twisted wreckage, spilling blood all over the custom-made tartan seats. His partner in crime was similarly injured, trying to remove evidence of the botched theft. At this point, Barris had had enough of the little bastard. It was becoming too much of a burden, and after all, the presence of non-Dean-related bloodstains devalued the wreck as a long-term investment. The California Highway Patrol had been attempting to get a hold of the car for some time now, hoping to use it in a traveling vehicle safety exhibition. After the break-in, Barris finally agreed to hand it over. Little Bastard was donated to the Highway Patrol and would soon hit the road once again. Dean's cursed Porsche became the centerpiece of a graphic public safety warning against the consequences of speeding. It was paraded throughout the Golden State, displayed alongside large posters with the words, James Dean's last sports car, and this accident could have been avoided, emblazoned in font barely larger than the persona of the dead actor himself. The tour proceeded without incident until March 1959, when the exhibit made its third stop in Fresno, California. That night, a fire of unknown origin swept throughout the building where the wreck was being stored. The structure nearly burnt to the ground, but mysteriously, Little Bastard's wreckage was left undisturbed. Personally, I would have decided to cancel the tour after this incident, but the California Highway Patrol wasn't about to give up their crusade for highway safety just yet. Several weeks later, the Porsche's corpse was hoisted onto a flatbed truck and sent off on the road once more. A man named George Barakas was hired to transport the gruesome goods, and unfortunately, he was behind the wheel when the curse struck again. In yet another freak accident, the truck was struck by an oncoming vehicle, the impact of which launched Barakas out of the driver's seat just as the cursed cargo became unsecured and flew off the flatbed. Little Bastard landed directly on top of Barakas, crushing him to death. Despite this tragic event, 
Highway Patrol insisted the taxpayer-funded show must go on, and James Dean's last race car would continue to tour. In what I'm sure was thought of as an excellent marketing decision, but could be more accurately described as a textbook act of tempting fate, the car was put on display at a high school on September 30th, the anniversary of Dean's death. A crowd of morbidly curious teenagers were examining the gruesome wreckage from several yards away. A safe distance, one would think, when suddenly three separate bolts securing the exhibition supports snapped at the exact same moment. One end of the platform collapsed and the car lurched forward and an unlucky 15-year-old boy was run over, his legs crushed and hips broken. Little Bastard had maimed one more victim. Some people, or rather some bureaucratic government organizations in this case, never learn their lesson. And not long after running over a high school student, Little Bastard was back on the road. While the Porsche was being towed near Oakland, California, Little Bastard was secured to a truck bed when it inexplicably broke in two, became unsecured, fell off the truck, and landed smack dab in the middle of a bitchy stretch of highway. The ensuing traffic collision caused multiple serious injuries and left one person dead, yet another victim for Little Bastard. Just a few weeks later, the Porsche was en route to Oregon when the driver tasked with transporting the cursed cargo made an unscheduled comfort stop at a roadside convenience shop. In hindsight, it was probably the best decision of the driver's career. While he was safely away from the vehicle, the emergency brake failed, sending both truck and bastard crashing into the storefront. There were no casualties this time, and the now nationwide exhibition continued on its merry way, though by now it would come as no surprise if casualties did occur and everything continued as planned anyway. And by the end of 1959, Little Bastard had reached New Orleans. Little did anyone know this would be its last stop. While the wreck was resting quietly on a well-secured display stand, it suddenly broke apart once again, this time into 11 separate pieces. The days of James Dean's death car's traveling exhibit had finally come to an end, and it was time for Little Bastard to come home. In early 1960, arrangements were made for the car to be returned to George Barris, this time by train rather than truck, perhaps the most sensible decision made by the car's caretaker so far. And the infamous spider was carefully sealed up in a boxcar bound for Los Angeles. But when it came time to unload the highly valuable hunk of metal, the boxcar was empty. Little Bastard had vanished. Unsurprisingly, George Barris was rather disappointed by this turn of events. Desperate to track down the missing piece of Dean memorabilia, he immediately hired the services of the famed Pinkerton Detective Agency, but year after year of searching yielded no results. In fact, no trace of Little Bastard has ever been found. What happened to James Dean's infamous Porsche? It has been suggested that Bears staged the disappearance himself, hoping to keep his cash cow of a car in the news for as long as possible. Not an implausible argument. After all, evidence suggests that Barris might be responsible for much of the legend surrounding the so-called cursed car, a topic we'll address shortly. But what could he really have to gain from the disappearance, other than the rights to sell a sensational story? Surely, Little Bastard would have been worth more as a tangible possession rather than as a lost legend. Right? Perhaps not. According to Lee Raskin, author of James Dean, At Speed, the vanishing act was a latched attempt to keep a carefully constructed myth from fading in the public's imagination. This also happens to be the most popular argument against the existence of a curse, that Barris had invented the entire story in order to profit from touring the supposedly malevolent vehicle. It was a very lucrative plan for quite some time, but as the 1960s approached, public interest in James Dean's death car began to wane, along with Barris's profit margin. If the supposedly cursed car was simply put back in storage to quietly rot away without claiming any more victims, the legend Barris had so successfully built up may have come into question. But if there was no car, there could be no more victims, and the legend could live on. Barris would be able to give interviews and write about the curse for many more years, earning a tidy sum along the way. It's a logical chain of events, but far from a universally accepted one. Others believe that the curse is very, very real indeed, though not all believers agree on the curse's origins. Some claim it was the result of Dean's rumored involvement with Satanism, witch covens, and black magic. His supposed interest in the occult may have caused not only the curse, but the crash that took the young actor's life. Indeed, Dean had been close friends with actress Myla Nurmi, better known as Vampira. There was gossip that the friendship had become a romantic affair. When Dean was questioned about their rumored relationship, he denied it emphatically. Some say out of fear that such an association might harm his career. According to this version of the story, 
Then Pyra wasn't too happy with this public rejection. In an act of revenge, she used the powers of black magic to place a spell upon Dean, causing his death and hexing his beloved little bastard. Others discount the theory of a curse altogether, instead pointing out that there seemed to be something inherently ill-fated and unlucky about Dean himself, a general air of misfortune so powerful that it could spread to those around him. One could endlessly argue for or against this theory, but perhaps it has some substance to it. Consider the fact that the other leading actors in Rebel Without a Cause also died relatively young and in very tragic circumstances. Dean's co-star and one of his best friends, Sal Mineo, was stabbed to death on the streets of West Hollywood in 1975, aged 37. Natalie Wood, Rebel's romantic leading lady, drowned in a boating accident in 1981, aged 43. And another actor, Nick Adams, overdosed in 1968, aged just 36. He had only played a minor role in the film, but he didn't escape this version of the curse. In my opinion, the most compelling argument for the existence of a curse lies within the Porsche itself. Perhaps the car was haunted by some malicious force before Dean even set eyes on it. If so, dubbing the speed machine Little Bastard certainly could have contributed to its transformation into a death trap. Any negative energy that might have been inherently present in the car certainly would have been magnified by the horrific accident that fateful September evening and may have endured long after the death of its owner. Whether this was the result of supernatural forces or not, one fact remains beyond doubt. Those who survived the crash certainly became cursed in one way or another. Rolf Wuthreich never fully recovered from his injuries. He struggled with depression and survivor's guilt for the rest of his life, trauma compounded by the many letters he received from those who blamed him for the accident. After returning to Germany, he endured a series of failed marriages and succumbed to alcoholism. Multiple failed suicide attempts followed, culminating in a 1967 incident in which he stabbed his fourth wife 14 times with a kitchen knife in a botched murder-suicide. Wuthreich was found guilty of manslaughter, rehabilitated in a mental facility, and eventually released. He returned to work for Porsche and briefly re-entered the racing world, but some wounds are too deep to heal. On July 22nd, 1981, Rolf Wuthreich lost control of his car and crashed into a residential building while under the influence of alcohol. The 53-year-old was pulled from the wreckage, but died on the scene, just like James Dean. As for Donald Turnipseed, he may have escaped the crash without any serious injuries, but he too was left emotionally and mentally scarred by the accident. Even after the 23-year-old student was found not to be responsible for the crash, he still refused to comment on the events of that day for the rest of his life. He died of lung cancer in 1995, at the age of 63. I must admit, today's topic is one more of legend than a fact. Many of the aforementioned stories are difficult, if not impossible, to verify, and most are likely outright fabrications in their entirety. However, there are two irrefutable final points I'd like to make. First, and most obviously of all, James Dean's legacy lives on, looming larger than it ever did during his tragically short life. Thousands of people visit his grave each year, as well as the site of his death, where several memorials mark the end of a life and the beginning of more than one legend. I can't help but think that perhaps that's what he would have wanted, though perhaps under different circumstances. Secondly, whether there ever was a curse or not, whether any fell victim to the malicious machinations of a wrecked race car or not, one cannot discount the fact that many, Many people felt an immense sense of dread and foreboding emanating from the inanimate object known as Little Bastard. Dean's final days are filled with well-verified accounts of worried friends cautioning him against driving the car, stern warnings about the dangers of his choice method of transportation, and ominous premonitions of death. It comes as no surprise that the confident, headstrong young man on his way to stardom ignored this advice. But perhaps he should have listened to his own. Shortly before his death, James Dean was interviewed for a national safety campaign against reckless driving, in which the actor warns listeners against speeding and taking unnecessary risks on the highway. The two-minute PSA ends with television host Gig Young asking, One more question. Do you have any special advice for the young people who drive? Dean replied, Take it easy driving. The life you save might be mine. <laughs>